All right, good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, March 8th, 2021 at 7.01 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes is absent. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630-743-4085 and recording their comment. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment tonight. We also do have public comment cards out somewhere, right, Melissa? Where yes. are those at? They are out right in the hall. Up, up there by the door. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start off today, as we always do, with the flag salute and the Pledge of Allegiance. We're welcoming El Sierra School with Principal Lynn. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lynn, the principal from El Sierra. I'm excited um, to be here to talk about El Sierra tonight. And we have a virtual flag salute from our students. So I'm going to get that <coughs> up here. Hello everyone, we are the student council officers of El Sierra School. Stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy. Uh, we're very proud of our student council. Um, we just got up and running in February, and already we had a big event where our student council was able to have students across the whole school uh, design and make valentines that we sent out to uh, seniors. This was an operation that was led by uh, State Senator John Curran, and we were able to make over 200, right around 200 Valentines uh, for the seniors. So that was pretty cool for them to be able to do that so quickly. And you can see there, there's a virtual Zoom meeting for all our student council officers and building, or I'm sorry, and uh, classroom reps. Um, that's pretty nice to be able to see that they're excited about some of the events that we have coming up. Some of the old things that we've had in the past, like our Bobcat Fridays are getting started up again this, this, uh, this month. They're coming up with some pretty creative things to keep the, school, the students pretty excited about student council. So, big thanks to them. Uh, Good morning, Elsewhere School. Here are the announcements for the week of February 22nd. We'll get that in just one second. Um, <laughs> so, the, uh, the exciting part, really, as a principal, is that we're working hard to be able to have all our families connected. We have some of our students, as you know, that are remote in sections at other schools. Um, so one of the things we want to be able to do, and I think all the principals have really jumped on board with this, is to create announcements each week. And one of the nice parts about that is the intention for that was for our remote students to still stay connected to the school, but a lot of our on-site students, especially in our upper grades, have said, hey, can't we watch those announcements too, which makes me feel good about the content that I'm putting out. So I wanted to show this um, to everybody here to be able to see these are an example of what our announcements look like. Good morning, else here at school. Here are the announcements for the week of February 22nd. We're very excited about our Math Spirit Week coming up this week. Here is a list of all the fun things that you can do this week. We hope that you work hard at math, not just for this week, but for the whole year. I thought it was pretty cool to see an actual bobcat at El Sierra last week, helping us out with all the snow. <laughs> yep, that's the machine, the bobcat. We'd like to wish happy birthday to the following people this week. Don't forget that we have picture day on Wednesday this week. And now it's time for our joke of the week. Knock, knock. <laughs> Who's there? <laughs> Cow goes. Cow goes, whoo. <laughs> no. Cow goes, moo. <laughs> have a great week. 
So you get a little bit of a laugh tonight with that. Um, the funny thing about that is like those are things that you know the kids get to see me as a principal in a different light. Obviously, a, you know, an animated form there. But um, the idea really about, about that is that it's just a little bit of something to kind of you know, the stressful time and stuff like that for everybody. We leave, we leave a little bit of that, but also help that connection be there. Um, something I've enjoyed doing um, you know throughout the course of the year and. You know, really that whole idea of being connected. We see there, you know, we're not the biggest school, but you know, we have around 260 students and about 40 staff. Um, you know, that's a lot of people to stay connected, but it also, one of the things we really thrive on at us here is that you know, family feel. We want to keep that going there. So that's kind of why I had that there to highlight, plus to give you a fun joke. Uh, the other thing is you know, really working hard to create that new normal. Uh, one of the big things for me as a, as a principal, I always love to give high fives you know, to our students you know, as they come into the building, as they leave the building, as they get off the bus and off the bus, all those types of things. I didn't want to be a super spreader this year, so I had to stop doing that. So we exchanged high fives for temperature checks. And that was one of the things at the beginning of the year, you know, as I'm greeting students, instead of with a high five, it's with my hand to their forehead you know, to check their temperature. Um, but you know, that became a new normal pretty quick. You know, we went from you know, young students to um, kind of being nervous about that to them just kind of embracing that this is, was that new normal. But I'm glad that we're not still doing that, by the way. Um, <laughs> the other part is like being creative with all the different spaces that we have in the building. You know, at LCR, we have a lot of flexibility with, you know, without having brick and mortar walls on the inside of the building, having a lot of flexibility to move our walls. But we also had a spot where we needed to be a little bit more creative. And you'll see there in the middle uh, picture there is our old stage that turned into a second grade classroom. Um, it was really neat to be able to see um, how quick that turnaround happened and how creative if you give you know, a teacher an opportunity to be creative with some parameters of what she's able to do. Um, and that's one of the things that I've been really impressed with all of our teachers at El Sierra. To see there, you know, Mr. Zach, our PE teacher, teaching a Zoom uh, PE lesson. Right behind him there, you'll see there's like a little closet that used to just be the storage. Now that was really his small gym that we would call it, where he'd be teaching a lot of his uh, Zoom lessons from. So things like that have been neat to be able to see just how well the staff has adapted and how they've embraced all the different changes that have come across to them this year. Very excited about having dual language back at El Sierra when the program first started. In the first year it was at El Sierra, and then because of space issues it moved, and now because of space issues we're back at El Sierra, and it's been wonderful to have um, both uh, teachers teaching uh, two grade levels. We have a kindergarten and first grade um, being taught, and then we also have second and third grade uh, being taught. I always feel like when we have dual language that I get a promotion because the students refer to me as El Director and that's kind of a neat term <laughs> instead of being the principal all the time. So, um, but the students have been you know, wonderful talking about teachers that have been adapted to different learning you know, styles and things like that. They went from you know, being in a closed classroom to being in an open uh, school building, but then also they're both teaching concurrently right now where they have students in remote and students are on site teaching simultaneously. Um, so to see that effort on their part on a day, daily basis has been very impressive as well. Some of the really neat things that have happened this year, um, at El Sierra we have, um, we're trying to figure out a way, how can we raise some money for some of our needy families around the holidays? And one of our parents came up with the idea, what if we have, he was like, I got a Buddy the Elf um, costume. What if I dress up as Buddy the Elf and we have a drive by where parents can drop off gift cards uh, for our families in need? We thought oh, we'll do that on a Friday and see what kind of you know, money we can make. And we thought maybe we raise a couple hundred dollars. In reality, we raised thousands of dollars on being able to do that and give cards to raise and give to a lot of the families. Um, not only just for the holidays, but throughout the course of the rest of this year, um, which is nice. Um, so that was a fun event where families were able to just drive up and give a gift card and see Buddy the Elf and take a picture with him. So that was a lot of fun. Um, the last two years, we've been fortunate to be able to have a math night. Um, Katie Herkus was our um, interventionist last year, and she was able to put that together for an in-person event. And then this year, we have uh, Mrs. Omolzak, um, and she was able to get a grant to be able to have that as a virtual event this year. And honestly, like the virtual event, we got a lot of positive uh, feedback from families just because it was an inter very interactive for the whole family, but she didn't have the noise of being in the gym to be able to do a lot of those games. So that actually might be one event even if we are in person with events in the future, then we might look at a virtual um, option um, moving forward with that too. The big news at El Sierra, as you all know, is our new playground. Um, this was something that 
If you asked me five years ago, how long is it gonna take for us to be able to raise the money to get that? You know, I might have said is hopefully before I retire. <laughs> um, but in, in all honesty, our PTA has really stepped up the last few years in fundraising. But then last year, you know, the, the big thing was really getting that grant from Representative Anastasia Marek Murray and the grant from the state of Illinois to be able to get this uh, playground moving. Um, with the mild December, if you remember back in December, we didn't have a lot of snow at that point. We were able to get a lot of the construction done with the playground is pretty close to being finished. Yeah, it's just really right now the finishing touches. So you see the picture right there um, of on the right there is what the playground looks like when we had some snow on the ground, but it's pretty close to being done. And the kids are really waiting with bated paid breath right now to be able to get on that playground and, and play on it. Um, but the thing for me right now is that as I look at it, I'm just very proud. I think as the, a lot of the families walk by, and they're saying that they can't wait for this playground to be you know, up and running. And for us to be able to have this as soon as possible is amazing. Um, I'm going to turn things over here in just a second to uh, one of our PTA executive board members. Um, but I want to highlight right there is last year was our 50th anniversary. So this is a picture from pre-COVID. Um, so <laughs> there's no there's not social distancing in that, but it was a huge celebration, not only just for Elsevier, but for the entire community. We had lots of families that were from the first class of you know coming through Elsevier back in 1969. We were able to come through there. We were with the time capsule. and. It was just an amazing, you know, fun event. And there's a drone that we had here taking a picture of you know, everything that happened. And I you know, look back at that, and I'm so thankful that we were able to do that, um, you know, in the last school year compared to if, what that celebration would have taken place this year. So um, but right now I'm going to turn it over to Katie Thomas. She's one of our executive board members, and she's got some great things to say about the PTA. Hello. Uh, so like Jason was just talking about, the big um, goal of the PTA is just being part of that partnership. And that's what is so amazing about El Sierra, is that we're just trying to work together for the best education for our students. And so on the next slide here, just like all of you, the word of the year has been pivot. So we have been trying to take the things that we were doing before and pivot them into something that would work for the environment we're in right now. So some things we're really proud of is providing instructional supports to our amazing staff members. So providing that scholastic news lets the kids know what's going on in the world right now, which they all need, and um, just that extra little reading exposure. Field trips, again, it's a pivot. It'll be a virtual historical perspective for kids this year, but still allows our students to have that extra educational enrichment and trying to take things like our birthday book program and how can we do that in a safe and socially distanced way but still be able to celebrate with books. And again, we're pivoting even with our social events. So what was a fall fest um, became a virtual dance party with Coach Josh and the kids were dancing at home but they were so excited to be able to interact and Zoom in a fun way see their classmates and again really feel excited about things that are going on at school. We took our normal breakfast with Santa and changed it into socially distanced pictures with Santa. Still got to see the big guys, still got to feel like you've got that connection with your school but in a new reinvented way. This was an election year for us in November, so one of the things we want to do is to be able to, as voters came into the building, or into the gym, to um, have some positive things in the building so that they're standing there kind of waiting that they'd be able to see what else here is all about. So Katie helped us you know, create some things that the kids could put up on Seesaw, and then we print those out and put them in throughout the, the gym. So I picked, picked three of these ones here for us to be able to show you. Um, this is, what was your favorite thing about El Sierra? One of the students says there that I like every teacher um, that, I'm sorry, I like that every teacher helps us with every subject that we need help with. That's one of the great things you want to be able to see. The middle one's really funny there where it says, um, is, a, is a great place to learn. Um, and then I love that, I can't read for what it says here. I love that. <laughs> 
I, I love, love Elsie so, so much. Oh, yeah. I, I, I never want to leave. That's the part there. <laughs> and I love that, too, because um, obviously we want kids to feel connected. We also want them to feel like they don't ever have to leave either. The other one there really captures you know, the middle part there where it says, there are no walls, uh, which helps keep students quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things that I, I can't tell you enough. Whenever I give tours to parents that are incoming, you know, they want to see about El Sierra. Back when I could give tours, I would, you know, tell them really El Sierra is a lot more like a library than it is a gym. You know, you're going to walk in there, you're not going to hear, you know, loud craziness and things like that. It's really going to be a lot more like a library, and it has students actually recognize that means a lot. This year, I will tell you, with being socially distant, six feet apart, with masks. And noise volume is a little bit more than, than we've had in the past, but it's just because there's a lot more space being used to get about voices being heard. Uh, but in a normal year, definitely a lot more like a library than a gym. Um, this, we asked the staff to do the same thing. This is a question that I have in my newsletter, and both of the Students Council uh, sponsors right there, Mrs. Encrosi and then Mrs. Marquez, um, they talk about they love the students. I also really enjoy the open setting. And I've learned so much from, my, from getting to see my coworkers in action. That's one of the benefits that teachers really talk about year in year out with the open model is that they are able to capture you know, a few minutes of watching what their other peers are doing in rooms near them. The other part there I think is really nice with Mrs. Marquez. She's one of our resource teachers you know, the people. We have the best students, families, and staff. And this is somebody that works with multiple grade levels you know, and with students over multiple years and working with multiple families over multiple years. So, and then Mr. Bennett right there is one of our sixth grade teachers. You know, he talks about the open format, how it allows for collaboration with his colleagues and enables me to maintain relationships with students throughout the building. We always hear about you know, the teachers talking about each other, being able to see each other in action. But it really hit me when he talked about being able to connect with students over multiple years uh, because you really do get to see students in you know, other classes after you've had them or students that are coming up to you and things like that, and building those relationships early on. And I think does, that really does help that um, family feel within our building. Um, asking some of the families what are their favorite things about El Sierra. You can see there that uh, Mr. Thomas here says that you know my favorite thing about El Sierra is the chance to be an active member of the school. That's one of the things we really look, look for that outreach with our families. He's talking about our watchdogs program, which is you know, dads with great students. Um, we haven't been able to do that this year, but it's something we look forward to being able to have those uh, parent volunteers coming in more in the future. Um, in the middle there, uh, Mrs. Bobianco talks about best thing else there is a sense of community. Um, even during this pandemic, the interaction between parents, students, and teachers has been amazing, and it's a true testament to how close knit the school community is. Um, and then you can see right there, uh, Mrs. Robeck says here that we love uh, this family-like family atmosphere at El Sierra and knowing that our child's teachers truly care about him and his learning. Those are things that, you know, from day one, we want our families to feel um, that and the fact that they're willing to share that with you guys tonight means a lot uh, to me. We always talk about, you know, so what are the challenges? And I think the Sunshine and Roses, you know, at every school in El Sierra is no different. You know, one of the things for us conversations that we keep working on. How do we improve our test scores? Um, you know, that's one of the things that is always the elephant in the room in conversations. And you know, with that, I feel a lot of that heavy lifting has been done in terms of us being fully aligned. We want to have our curriculums the same as all the other schools in the district. But the other part about that, you know, is that having that belief that every student can learn challenging material. That's one of the things that um, we've really had a big focus on these last few years. Um, really leveling that playing field for when the students do take that state test, that it's not the first time they've seen that kind of format of a test, that you're giving them opportunities so they can feel successful. And the teachers have done a nice job with that. Um, as we move forward with whatever lies ahead with testing, you know, I, I do feel confident that we're closing that gap. Um, the other part there is a fluctuating enrollment. You see the size of El Sierra, 260 students. and some levels, hey, that's great. On other levels, it means that you know, the moving of three kids in and out of a grade might mean that we have two sections or might mean that we have one section. Because of that, there's a lot of fluidity, not only with our teaching staff of grade levels that they teach, but also having that ownership of this is my grade level and my content that I've been teaching for a number of years. Um, as a principal, my answer is what also gives you that perspective of being able to teach the grade level below or teach grade level up above you so that you have a better perspective of you know, that, that continuum. Um, but if you ask any teacher, uh, most of them would prefer to be teaching the same level multiple years um, to kind of get that, that depth there. So those are some of the things that we kind of continually work on. As a building principal, I do my best so that we don't have people moving over their grade levels all the time. But unfortunately, it does happen with fluctuating enrollment. Um, and 
In the last part there, this is some of the sidewalk chalk at the beginning of the year. Um, here we have together but six feet apart, you know, and stronger together but six feet apart. And that, that's something that I really do feel like, you know, just those messages of, of positive of positivity from our PTA, from our families, from our students and our staff. You know, really, we're doing the best that we can right now as we plan for some of these upcoming shifts and things like that. Um, there's a lot of positivity, but also a lot of, you know, apprehension of how do we make all this work? And if we stay together, we, we definitely can be stronger. And I think that's kind of the message we want to send forth. Um, but thank you very much for letting me present about the great things at El Sierra and some of the things that we're working on. And I appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much for being here. And thank you as well. It's great to have the PTAs back. It's been a while since we've had a, a PTA presentation here in person, so we really, really do appreciate it. I think you're our first one, Ms. Thomas, back. So thank you. It's yeah. good to see you. <laughs> All right, first up in our non-action reports is a spotlight on our school. We're going to talk about uh, staffing and programs of instruction with Dr. Uzentis. tonight. I'm um, really to update the board on the plans thus far for 2021-2022 related to enrollment and staffing. And then the thought would be as we have more information, we certainly will update the board then come April, May, and June will be an ongoing process. So a couple points about staffing as we go into any presentation. Um, First off, before I get too deep, I always want to thank Dr. Yusentis. She does a wonderful job. When you think about 13 schools and all the different employees we have and the different employee groups and trying to fit them all together, it becomes a very complicated puzzle. Uh, oftentimes it's long weekends and nights, so thank you for all of your efforts to make everything work and rework uh, numerous times throughout the school year. We really appreciate it. As both Jane and I will tell you, staffing constantly evolves as we look at school districts. Um, with the influx of technology, uh, with pandemics, with all these different things that come forward in a school year, um, we add, add, add on, and then we have to reevaluate what positions are no longer needed or as effective as they once were because we're constantly evolving in school districts, or at least we should be evolving in school districts to meet the needs of our children. Budget also has a big impact on staffing. Uh, I think all of us as superintendents, we could probably spend three times what the budget is if we had our way, but we do have a budget and we have to uh, abide by the budget. And this year is a challenge because of the significant hit that the pandemic has had on our budget, uh, you know, with things like transportation or just all the extra expenditures that we've had. We also have to be very cognizant of restrictions with learning models in our limited space in our buildings and the impact that they may have. So O'Keefe is a very good example of that. Student enrollment um, will fluctuate. So this year we saw uh, some families opt for private school. We saw other families come in and we may continue to see that until things can level out. One of the things that we want to emphasize tonight is that we're carefully reviewing all of our positions, our allocations, and our systems to identify efficiencies while maximizing our effectiveness. So regardless of if we're in a tight budget, Every single school year, the administration should be bringing to the Board of Education ways to become more efficient and more effective as a school district. And so Jane's going to dive a little deeper. As we look back to almost a year ago, last May, this slide was presented May 2020, and really based on the work through various working groups, through the strategic plan process, we set the goal to restructure our models and again, more to more effectively, more efficiently and effectively provide that quality instruction and support for our students across all of our district 58 schools. And so again, this is going a year ago really targeting special education. As one example, looking at our district self-contained programs versus the number of students who are outplaced and looking for those opportunities where we can Hold, have special programs within our schools and bring some of our students back and we were very successful in doing so. We want to continue um, to develop those industry programs in the future years as well. We set that goal of really very closely looking at our K-6 class organizations, working towards those lower class sizes, 
our board, as you know, um, added positions last year and the year prior to continue to bring down those class sizes to be more manageable, which allows much more flexibility um, for our staff in what instruction looks like and how we can support our kids in and be more effective with instruction. We dedicated um, time and and dollars to our intervention services and looked at reorganizing and restructuring, again, to try to be more efficient and more effective. A year ago, we did add interventionist positions. We have what we call our interventionists. We would have resource teachers or special education teachers as well as reading specialists and then added an interventionist position as well, multiple positions going into the school year and really looking how we can, think, how we can support students differently the thought with that plan in that model was to then continue to look for opportunities to expand that model in future years. And then the fourth billet, bullet is looking at our math instruction and that model for acceleration. At that point a year ago, we had, um, you know, different schools were handling acceleration differently. It just, because of our, the way our staffing model, and we were looking at developing a plan that really was more consistent across all schools. For example, the sixth grade accelerated math students being taught, all of them being taught by a middle school teacher. So as our team began to dig in for 20, 21-22, excuse me, we really wanted to provide some time tonight to again reiterate some of those priorities and update our board on, you know, this, these were our plans at the very beginning. We absolutely feel it's a priority to maintain those class size targets that were established by the Resources Review Council um, if not even improve upon them. So our, our K2 classrooms, we are looking for that staffing to have 20 few, 24 or fewer students. Um, and then in grades three through eight, that 26 or fewer. Again, the target is to hit that goal in 80% of our classes. We wanna keep increasing that percentage to, to bring them those class sizes across all of our schools in as many classrooms as possible. We are continuing that priority of maintaining those quality programs of instruction as well as the consistency, which came up quite a bit throughout the strategic plan process, the equity of opportunities for our children, as well as consistency across our schools. And so our elementary, our art, music, PE, and library instruction maintain, remains a priority. We would like consistent programs in all of our elementary schools. If you think back, that's art once a week, music once a week, library instruction, as well as that book advisory in our library program. PE instruction is two to three times per week, um, depending on that grade level, with primary being two times a week, and then the intermediate classes at three times a week. Looking at our EL services, and again, making sure we can find those opportunities for all the children in all of our schools, a consistent opportunity. Uh, this last year and then going into this next year, really look closely at our gifted program and how do we do, how we are differentiating instruction for our children to making sure we are meeting the needs of our gifted as well as our accelerated students. And then again, that priority of looking at math acceleration, developing more consistent uh, model across all of our schools as to what that will look like. So we continue into other priorities, that third bullet is really focusing on the curriculum development and implementation. There's been a lot of work in that area. We wanna continue the work in that area uh, and stress the importance of the support for our teachers through our coordinators and our instructional coaches. As we came into this school year, we really built a model of district-wide support for all elementary classroom teachers in the area of math in all, all classrooms, all schools. Um, that support being provided by, again, our coaches and coordinators, and then we want to continue to build on that and to develop the And then dedicated, dedicating that ongoing professional learning time, which we were unable to do during this school year because of the pandemic, but we want to bring that back. You'll see later in this agenda that is in the calendar, the recommended calendar for next year. Additional priorities. Again, is looking at our special education pro programs and services. 
looking at making sure we have that equitable opportunity across all our schools and maintaining the high quality services that we have. Looking at looking closely and prioritizing our student support services with consistency across our schools. So meaning our nurses, the RNCSN model, we want to absolutely want to continue to have a nurse in every school five days per week. Maybe a nurse, an RN, or a certified school nurse, but at least having that one, um, having a nurse five days a week is kind of wonderful. Building on the social work psychologist model and continuing that high level of support with the mental health clinicians as well as the social or the special education support. Our psychologists, we have expanded their role. They have been working to facilitate more of our special education meetings, and we'd like to to dedicate that time and continue dedicating that time. It's a very important role in the district. We are prioritizing, which would be no surprise, that certified interventionists again, and we want to continue to build that out as we had planned prior to the pandemic. And then really under special programs, um, this goal is that the continuing, the expansion of the RISE program, one of our self-contained programs, right now Indian Trail, we are very pleased to be adding a classroom at Pierce Down for the elementary school. Dr. Russell mentioned the OP program. So you'll see that is a priority. If we, we feel that OP is a valuable program that we would like to offer to our families, we do need to keep in mind and, and, and have more information as to any restrictions with the six foot social distancing. Um, we will need to get those family commitments before we staff, which is why you know, some of our positions we have not rehired back until we know are we going to be able to offer OP. We would like to, if we are, what would that look like? Would it look like the, what it had in a more typical school year? Or if we have restrictions, with our space, would we need to consider some other opportunities, some other ideas? For example, maybe offering or keeping only some of our buildings that could um, allow, that does allow for the space, or building out some sort of um, virtual component. So that's, again, once we have more information, we can, we can continue to explore those possibilities. So our next steps at this point, um, with, it, as you've heard earlier, some of the unknowns. We have the reduction of force, which is our teachers tonight, at tonight's board meeting later in the agenda. Uh, we do the RIF, where these are first year teachers. They're doing a fabulous job, and we would love to hire them back, but we do need to hold positions back until we really have that confirmed enrollment, and we know how many teaching positions we need, and we can, can make that next decision regarding OP. In April, we will open registration for our families. We are hoping to really push and get the word out in April to confirm that enrollment, which drives so much of our planning in this next few months. We need to know how many, how many students are coming back to school next school year and get the registrations in to make those decisions about middle school schedule, classroom teachers at the elementary level. Um, as well as our going into our special ed schedules and related really service staff. Tied to that will be then the decision about O'Keefe. Once we have in, in April and May, hopefully, more information as to requirements from whether it's the health department or CDC regarding the social distancing in the spaces in the schools. And then we keep building out from there. Once we know our classroom positions, we then can build out the art, music, and teacher librarian schedules. There are some um, art, music, and PE teachers on that RIF list tonight. So again, we would hold back those positions until we have our enrollment. We can hopefully hire them, those teachers back into the district. We will, in ongoing, review and refine those schedules for related service staff. We are anticipating um, the majority of our related service staff, that social work, psychologists, would be stable and pretty much flat with what we have had the prior year. Um, we are actively recruiting now psychologist positions, and um, we'll, we'll soon be posting our social work and resource positions so we can continue to recruit and get the staff that we want. 
and then finally, really, it's just that, that ongoing review and that refinement. If, as any new information becomes available, any updated information, it will just be this the ongoing process. So just in summary then, obviously information is still in flux. It always tends to be in flux this time of year, but with the pandemic, that certainly is causing some of these decisions that we would have made by this evening to be pushed back until April. But by April, we really do want to have the majority of these decisions solidified um, so we can begin uh, the final planning for next school year. One of the points that we always have to make again, uh, back to the intro slide, is that continuing in the status quo, meaning that everything stays the same every year, really isn't realistic, nor is it always the best decision. Um, this is an ongoing review. As Jane talked about, we're constantly reviewing our positions. Uh, we do have to, especially this year, carefully consider our budget and be fiscally responsible when we're making decisions. And what I mean by that is, you know, at the start of the school year, we had a $1.6 million deficit that we have to erase and we also have to put money in the bank to ensure we don't have to go out to tax anticipation warrants and to start saving for capital needs. With our low tax base, there really isn't a lot of wiggle room here and that's why this becomes a very tight decision-making process for our school district. However, we always wanna maintain these quality programs. At the same time, we wanna identify opportunities for efficiencies and as a superintendent, I know this is a no-brainer, but change is always challenging. And everybody in a school district always wants the latest and greatest things, and they should. But sometimes to get those, you have to make other decisions and change some of your existing programs, which is always going to cause friction and anxiety in a school district. And, and we've seen that before play out in District 58 and really every district I've been a part of. It's, it's really, again, trying to maintain those quality programs, but also looking for efficiencies. We will always make the decisions on what we feel is best for kids, and that's how we guide our final decision-making process. So with that, uh, Jane and I are available for any questions from the board. Thank you. Questions? Can you just maybe speak a little bit more about feasibility of O'Keefe? You mentioned the you know, six-foot distancing and kind of waiting for additional guidance and you know, waiting for enrollment numbers. Can you maybe just speak a little bit more about you know, how April and, and May is going to kind of play out to um, drive towards a decision of, of yes or no as to whether we're going to be offering O'Keep? We're, we're hoping, and I, I think Kevin could probably speak to you, but to have more guidance from CDC and the health department to help us with those decisions. Yeah. So a couple things that we're waiting on, and uh, I'm going to use the word imminent because that's what the DuPage County Health Department told us today. Um, the CDC has put out new guidelines uh, regarding social distancing and they're looking at community transmission levels. And I spoke to this a, a, a bit at the February 22nd meeting. Um, what we're seeing is numbers really starting to go down, although they, they seem to have kind of leveled off right now. But the CDC has actually put out guidance for schools suggesting that um, reducing uh, the, the distance is going to be permissible and that when your transmission levels get below 50 cases per 100,000, it's acceptable. What we're waiting for is we're waiting for the IDPH to interpret that guidance and then issue what we're doing. The other thing that we're closely monitoring is other districts that have abandoned the six foot uh, social distancing guidelines. We wanna talk to those districts, we wanna hear what they're doing. Obviously we're not comfortable doing that yet for a, vor a variety of reasons, um, but in the fall, uh, that may not be a reality that we have to deal with is, is the requirement of six feet of social distancing. What we're really pushing the state for is to give us an answer on that sooner rather than later so we can begin our planning. Um, if I were to bet right now, I think you would see some relaxing of those guidelines uh, for next fall, which is why O'Keep is something that we feel very strongly we want to offer. Uh, we're even going as far to have conversations with the Downers Grove Park District about extra space and other providers in town to see, you know, if we can't fit everybody in our buildings, is there an opportunity that we might be able to use some alternate sites and things like that? Again, those are just very high level conversations right now, but it is a very, very important thing for us to provide O'Keep and we want to do everything we possibly can to uh, provide that. So, Steve, I'm hoping within the next couple of weeks, IDPH will give us that guidance and then we'll be able to come back in April and share uh, a more realistic picture of what the fall is going to look like. All right. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Just to peek under the hood there on the logistics, is it that 
by having a six foot distancing requirement, it requires us to use more spaces in the building than we otherwise would. Hence, we can't make second grade a half day program, but the state does allow you to have a half day kindergarten program, and so that's that's how that works, or am I missing something? No, you hit the nail right on the head. That is exactly correct. Kindergarten in the state of Illinois is only a half day program. It's the only grade level, uh, or excuse me, a half day requirement. Uh, it's the only grade level that you can do that at. And so if something would have to give, that would be the one um, that, that you would have that flexibility on. Thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Any other questions? No? All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Jay. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are 56 communications received by the board. Okay, are there any additional communications anyone would like mm. to no. share at this time? All right. Mm. Let's kick off the first report to the board then, Dr. Russell. So there's a lot in the superintendent's report. Ed, there's just a lot going on that I, I want to update the board on. So uh, thank you for bearing with me. The first thing I want to do is I want to thank, on behalf of the Board of Education, the LCRA PTA, the staff and administration for the presentation this evening. We're very proud of all 13 of our schools and thoroughly enjoyed these presentations. And especially we want to thank LCRA and Jason and Katie for coming tonight. Um, it's always uh, special to me to see Jason up at the podium. Uh, Jason and I were hired together way back when, I think, what, 21 years ago? And who would have ever thought, Jason, that we'd be both presenting to the board on the same night? But um, time surely does uh, fly, uh, and uh, it's great to see you up here. In terms of curriculum instruction, this is just a reminder that on March 22nd, we postponed the curriculum workshop to talk about an instructional workshop in February. So we will be back at O'Neill on March 22nd for the curriculum workshop. We'll be discussing our assessments, we'll be discussing our curriculum, the grade level standards, and our instructional practices. So that's a conversation that we're still gonna have uh, coming up here toward the end of the month. I also want to inform the community and the Board of Education that we just received uh, some updates on our assessments uh, that are required. The U.S. Department of Education has not given any of the states or territories the opportunity to opt out of mandatory standardized testing. That includes tests like the IAR and also the science test. While I am a huge proponent of accountability, it is unfortunate that we need to take away from in-person and live instruction to conduct these tests, which take approximately one week to complete. So the thought of taking kids away to take another test, uh, I don't think sits well with, with any of us. Um, that's not that we're against accountability, it just makes it very challenging. Late last week, the Illinois State Board of Education informed districts that these tests may be able to be pushed back to the fall. Due to the number of staff needed to run our on-site and remote instructional program after spring break, this could certainly be a big relief for our students and staff if we did push it back to the fall. However, if the district pursues this route, it would mean that tests would have to be administered again in the spring for next school year. So it's not a good situation either way around. We're gonna to continue to meet with staff to consider all options available and then um, recommend a path forward uh, to the Board of Education. Uh, again, neither one is very appealing. The thought of getting kids back in school and then having them devote a week to testing this spring, again, isn't ideal. The thought of having kids do two rounds of testing in the fall on top of map assessments isn't always the most ideal either. What makes this particular round of testing in the spring challenging is because we're using every available space, and I mean every available space in our schools this spring, those are often places where we would be administering individual tests or small group tests uh, because of IEPs and, and the requirements there. So um, we have to work through all that, uh, given this curveball from the state, and uh, Justin and I will have more information for the board after we conclude our meetings over the next couple of weeks. In terms of finance, uh, the sale of the district's bonds has been completed. And our assistant superintendent, Todd Drayfall, reports that all the money has been received. So we want to thank Tom and the FAC for really uh, pursuing that and thank the board for its approval. Uh, this means that the money is now available to complete uh, capital projects like the Pierce Downer Roof and the mechanical equipment replacement. For facilities, um, it's been a, a long year. The district's task force le last met over one year ago at Leicester School on March 2nd. So it's, Think about how much has taken place in, the, in that last year. Uh, the meeting was very well attended and at that meeting, uh, the group made recommendations that we pursue uh, about $179 million in referendum uh, 
bond sales to fund projects like enhanced security, grade level reconfiguration, eight years of maintenance, a remodeling of all the bathrooms in the school district and adding air conditioning in all of our schools. We then held a special board meeting last March to talk about a robust community engagement before we made a final decision. Unfortunately, the pandemic struck and the community engagement process around a referendum had to be postponed. The district, though, fully intends to revive the conversation on the other side of this spring break as our facilities need to be repaired, renovated, or modernized. So those, all those needs are one year down the road. And so the intent of this part of the update is to inform the community that we do want to continue those conversations because we need to. While some things remain on hold, though, others do need to move forward. The district needs funds to address some urgent capital needs now and can't wait for the larger referendum, which will hopefully take place in 2022. Therefore, the district has proposed that the Longfellow Center, which was closed decades ago for instruction, should be sold. The building is very old, costly to maintain, and has many capital items that need to be addressed. Uh, to put it in perspective, Longfellow School closed in 1978 for instruction, and the building currently serves as storage and a home for the district's maintenance staff, technology staff, and around a quarter of the administrative team. The money received from the sale of Longfellow can be immediately put to use to address capital needs throughout the district. The district is also proposing to retrofit the current administrative building to serve as storage and the new home for the maintenance and technology teams. The administration would then move into a new lease location um, within the boundaries of District 58. The FAC fully supports this idea and the administration plans to ask the board to approve the district's architectural firm to begin work on the retrofitting of the current ASC at the next meeting in April. The board would then be asked to sell the Longfellow Center later this year. Originally, the sale of Longfellow was going to be discussed after the original referendum or in conjunction with the Village of Downers Grove building a new Village Hall that could be shared. Unfortunately, the Village Hall proposal has been tabled due to COVID and the district's capital needs can't wait. So again, if you remember from last year, we had talked about doing the master facility plan, then discuss Longfellow, then discuss the administrative center. Now we've had to reverse those because we need that access to capital. So now it would be Longfellow, the administrative center, and then the bigger bond question through the task force. Now to ensure that the district has not missed anything and to promote a robust community engagement process, the FAC is forming a small study group led by Todd Drayfall that will meet three times prior to the April board meeting. This group will review all the work to date so the taxpayers of the district can be reassured that the sale of the property has been thoroughly reviewed before a final recommendation uh, for any changes would be made to the board at the April meeting. In terms of public relations, the district successfully completed round one of the District 99 Consortium Vaccination Clinic on Sunday, February 28th. As a reminder, our consortium is comprised of our school district, Marker School District, Darien School District, Center Cass School District, Woodridge School District, Community High School 99, the Village of Downers Grove, the Village of Woodridge, the City of Darien, and the Village of Westmont. District 58 is extremely proud to have helped organize and run this clinic that allowed for all of our staff to be vaccinated, municipal workers, including police and fire, park district staff, and most importantly, our seniors. The school district dedicated approximately half of their allotment to seniors. In total, over 1,300 people received the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine a few Sundays ago. The next clinic will take place at Downers Grove South on Sunday, March 21st, and a sign-up email will be sent out this week for anyone who uh, participated in the first round. You'll get a new sign-up uh, this week for the second round. This clinic is another example of how school districts with support from their boards and communities have rallied together to assist those in need during this pandemic. In terms of personnel, later in the agenda, the board will be asked to approve the hiring of the new principal of Leicester School. The current principal, and I think she's back there, Karen Novak is retiring at the end of the year. On behalf of a grateful school district, thank you to Karen for her 12 years of dedicated service to District 58. Earlier today, our team shared that the district is in need of help from community members to assist with lunch at the elementary schools. We have heard from our community that there is a strong desire to increase the instructional day. In order to make this happen, we need your help. Please consider either working as a lunchroom supervisor or volunteering your time to give back to our schools during the pandemic. We need your help and would be grateful if you can join our team. I'm pleased to report at the start of this meeting, we've already had 69 individuals who have uh, registered to help us out. Uh, we certainly need some more. 
I was getting a lot of comments like 150. I want everybody to also keep in mind that 150 is a combination of outside and inside. So our teachers are also volunteering to do this. And so we'll, through a combination, that's how we get to that number. Technology. The technology department is working to prepare for the shift in our learning model after spring break. This requires creating new classes in PowerSchool and ensuring that our staff and students have access to the digital resources they need. We will also be collaborating with the B&G department to add visual equipment to about 20 new learning spaces across the district. So if we're using libraries and gyms, we have to make sure that those are fitted properly and James and his team are working hard to make that happen. Student services. This is an update on Aaron's Law. Special services have been partnering with outside agencies to support families in talking to their children about sexual abuse and prevention. This past month, over 100 families participated in training with the Darkness to Light Agency, a nonprofit agency dedicated to using research, education, and community advocacy to bring best practice strategies and child safety to communities. Additionally, special services will be hosting an evening in partnership with Magical Consulting and Counseling, a group that partners with therapeutic day schools or special education schools in the area, uncovering child safety strategies for children who have specialized care in the home and outside the home. This is planned for Wednesday, April 14th at 6.30 via Zoom with topic specific breakout sessions planned for April 22nd. So thank you to Jessica and her team for putting all of that together. I also want to take this time to update the Board of Education on our instructional model in our conversation from February 22nd. At the last board meeting, the board voted to increase the instructional time for our elementary and middle school students. The increased time is scheduled to begin after spring break. Elementary students are scheduled to increase to 4.25 hours in April and then to the greatest extent possible in May for the remainder of the year. Middle school students will increase their instructional day from approximately 8.30 to 2.25, 3 o'clock for music students, immediately following spring break. Middle school students will stay on the AB model due to social distancing requirements. There just isn't enough space to fit all the students in the school. For the remainder of the year, all students, though, will maintain six feet on site unless the guidance changes. This safety requirement is the reason why some students have to change teachers. There is simply no way to fit all the students in the classroom without some needing to change teachers at the elementary level and why the middle school students can't attend on site daily, as I shared before. At the elementary level, we will also need to pull several staff members out of their positions to make this work. Those staff members include, but are not limited to, specials teachers, reading specialists, math interventionists, and coaches. But this is certainly not ideal and will cause other services to be reduced. I firmly believe that the increased instructional time will greatly benefit our students academically, socially, and emotionally. The board also requested that the administration find ways to speed up the timeline for a full day of instruction at the elementary level to avoid a two-step process. The two-step process may inadvertently cause too many issues and also cause parents to schedule child care arrangements twice. Please note that we will also stagger the start times between preschool, elementary, and middle school so parents can make it from one school to another. I know that that was a question that many had asked. That is in the plans to stagger those by about 10 minutes so people can get from building to building. At the last meeting, we just put up a slide with a, uh, an asterisk that said, here are the start times, but we do plan on staggering those times and trying to align them to the current start times at the elementary in the middle. I am happy to report that the administration is making good progress toward a one-step process in speeding up this to start after spring break. The team is planning around the clock with building administrators and staff on scheduling class lists, lunch, and hiring additional staff. The administration hopes to send something out next week to families that will indicate whether this will be able to take place. While we are optimistic that it can be done, we also want to be cautious that we don't overpromise something that we end up not being able to deliver. I also recognize that we're at a similar point as a community that we were in during July, September, and November when other changes had to be made. As was the case earlier in the year, when other changes had to be made, um, we are starting to see those strong feelings come back. Some staff and community members welcome the change while others do not. Unfortunately, when tensions get high, some may choose to act in a manner that's not consistent with our values in District 58. Staff, administrators, board members, and community members on all sides of this issue have been attacked based on their opinions regarding increased instructional time. One of the things that separates our districts from others 
is that when it comes to debating these issues, we have a good, robust debate, we have a vote, and then everyone comes together to support that decision. Now is the time to once again come together and treat each other with the mutual respect and civility that we all deserve. We all want what is best for our students. The students deserve the very best, or excuse me, the students deserve the very best from all of us, and I'm committed to ensuring that we move forward together just like we have every step of the way. We will get through this next change and continue to provide our students and staff with the support they need to make it successful. Today is also International Women's Day, and we want to give a special shout out to all the women in District 58 that make a huge difference every single day. Many of us would not be where we are today without the help of our mothers, women educators, and other female leaders. We appreciate all that you do and can't thank you enough for your valuable contributions. That is the conclusion of the superintendent's report. Questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, you, t as far as um, the March 22nd meeting, which would be the curriculum workshop, mm -hmm. there, you're saying next week would be an announcement from your administration about whether it's going to be able to do it like, one step or two. Correct. What, when will teacher assignments go? When will no family, is it going to be two different notifications? Yeah, so. will know about their teachers or potential changes first and then whether, whether it's going to be a two-step process? So just to be clear, we're talking about the elementary. Correct. At the, at the elementary, we're committed to the week of March 8th, which is this week, this week, by the end of the week to get it to parents. And so we're still gonna hit that deadline because in the 4.25 hour model or the longer day model, the teacher assignments would be the same. And so by the end of this week, we will get out those class lists to our families and um, share the teacher assignments. Is it gonna be by by school community or will all the schools be doing it at the same time? Yeah, so all the schools will be releasing at the same time and Justin, James, or uh, Jane, let me know if I'm misspeaking here. What we will do is we will send out um, information from each school individually and at the same time then parents can log into PowerSchool to see the new assignments. Did I hit that right? Yeah, some of the individual communication from buildings may look a little different depending on the scope of change. But generally speaking, everything will be available. But it won't just be a, a, a cold, hey, go into power school and log on. We're going to be providing our families with information as to why these changes were made. Um, in some buildings, you'll see more changes than others. And so some could be a personal phone call. Others can be an explanation of a letter from the principal. And then a lot of conversations afterwards. And then as far as staggering the start times, because we mm -hmm. did hear from the community, as somebody that used to have a middle schooler and an elementary school and having to be at the, a lot of people are maybe driving and not taking the bus right now. Um, what that, which communication will that go? Yeah, so the start times for school will come out at the March 15th, that week, that communication. Next week's communication, um, okay. We are still finalizing it. For those uh, in, in the community, we share our buses with District 99 and District 68. And so all three districts have to work in conjunction with one another. All three districts are now currently talking about changing their instructional models after spring break. And so we are all dependent on one another start times. But what we're generally looking for at the elementary level and the middle school level is an 8.20 start time at the elementary school, an 8.30 start time at the middle school. So those would stagger. And then at the end of the day, we would also stagger them by 10 minutes. So if the elementary, excuse me, if the middle school is getting out at 2.20, we'd be looking at around 2.30ish for the elementary school so people could get there on time. Uh, we wanna make sure that we stagger those. And the presentation that we gave on February 22nd, they were all the same and that was done intentionally because we needed more information from the bus company. Right now, we're still trying to work with the high school, especially around the end of the day, to make sure that when we are done, that they can get to the high school with their times and to Woodridge 68. And then one other question um, about the lunchroom supervisor volunteers or mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, is it like, is it modeled the same way it was um, during pre-COVID uh, as far as when somebody in a building was gonna volunteer or, or be the lunchroom aide, um, the process and the protocols and the things they go through, is it the same? Yeah, it's a great question. I appreciate that. And Jane, please feel free to add on if I, if I miss anything. Um, we will never have a lunchroom supervisor that we don't train ahead of time, especially with child allergies 
and just making sure that people understand there's a big difference between supervising first graders at lunch and supervising sixth graders and then supervising middle school. Although being a former middle school lunchroom supervisor, sometimes there wasn't a big difference between <laughs> the first graders. Um, but food allergies especially. So there's a great deal of work that has to go into working with every supervisor to make sure that they're aware to making sure that we're wiping down areas correctly. Uh, that is a significant concern. Um, it, it's very near and dear to many of our parents and I completely understand why. Uh, when you're talking about EpiPens, all those things, we have to do a lot of training around all of those. And so there are several opportunities for training, even if we did have an accelerated start. Uh, while most of the school district is off for spring break, keep in mind the district office stays open. And so we're looking at uh, uh, training over spring break. We're also looking at trainings to take place that um, April 6th day on the election uh, to, to offer those trainings then. But we would follow the same protocols and procedures uh, in our personnel office with fingerprinting and background checks and all of that. And I, I did, I got it as a parent as well, but just to make sure that volunteers, you're looking for people that would, would volunteer for the full week, correct? Yeah, so the preference is always, if you're gonna sign up to do lunchroom duty, if you could sign up for all five days that makes life a lot easier on so many levels because what, what gets problematic is when you have somebody who can come on Mondays and then somebody who can come every other Tuesday, it becomes very difficult to manage. So obviously the preference is to get that consistent person. That being said, we will work with, with people who volunteer or who sign up to work because we, we need to fill these spots. Um, and again, I want to reiterate that our teachers are being great signing up. We've got families who are signing up. We have a long way to go. Uh, but Jane and I are going to be talking to several community groups, uh, starting with our uh, Education Foundation tomorrow evening, our PTA Council, um, Junior Women's Club, all these different groups throughout our community to see uh, crossing guards, m many people to see who can help. Great. Thank you for flushing that one. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? There's a lot of info in there. No? No, thank you. So, again, we hope to make those announcements. I, I know I'm getting a lot of questions, and I understand parents, you know, when I know the teacher changes, so that's going to come first. That will come by the end of this week. And then whether or not we can accelerate that timeline, which we feel pretty good about right now, but I just can't fully commit until we have more of the staffing finalized, which we're in the process of, uh, of doing. But we are certainly trying to do it all in one step to help alleviate uh, two transitions. And the lunches are in your individual cohort or your room correct right now unless the guidance changes so in middle school your co the kiddos in your cohort are going to stay where they are and same with ele or elementary you're correct. not going to the gym anymore or doing everyone's having it in their room with their their class that is correct think about lunch lunch in the classroom which is not necessarily unheard of for our school district so I, I know we've got Lester in the back there that that is something that we've had to do at Lester school for a very long time just because of the size of the school it's also not uncommon at the elementary level when you have things that are in the gym or setups that, that you have to have lunch in the classroom certainly is not our preferred option uh, but uh, during these times we, we have to do whatever we can to make sure that we can fit it all in thank you so just to, to clarify that the email that's coming next week not only will clarify just for the elementary on if we can do it in one step, but it's going to clarify the, the times in general, right? So our middle school times, our grade school times, all of those things will be hashed out. Correct. The right? week of the 15th, we have got our final busing uh, meetings this week with the high school and then also Woodridge. We will have all of that finalized. We're, we're getting very close. And so the week of the 15th, you will get all the start and end times. Yeah. Um, and then you will also get whether or not uh, we can get it to the greatest extent possible um, right at the uh, turn of spring break. Appreciate it. But in general, the times we're looking at, elementary would start at 8.20 and the middle school would start at 8.30, so we have that 10 minute break between. Our preschool times, by the way, are unaffected uh, by this. I'll just uh, say thanks to you and your team. Uh, Often, like great ideas are 10% of the problem and 9% of executing them. Uh, so, just appreciate you and your team for figuring out ways to navigate uncharted territory. And really, uh, the credit goes to um, you know our staff and the administration. Uh, what they've been doing nights and weekends to, to make this, I, I'm, I'm very proud to work alongside this team. Um, they continue to roll up their sleeves every step of the way and I'm uh, just so very grateful for all the hard work. We're not there yet, uh, but we are working very hard to, uh, to make this happen. 
And again, I do appreciate all the community feedback uh, that we've gotten. I understand this, these, uh, these changes are stressful. Uh, as a parent myself, I got an email from my school district saying that it's gonna be hybrid for the remainder of the year. A week later, I got another email that said, nope, after spring break, we're all coming back and we're gonna redo all the rooms and make it. So this is not just happening in District 58. It is happening around everywhere else and, and all school districts are going through uh, these growing pains. And, and um, I especially wanna thank our, our teachers as, as well and our uh, instructional support staff. Every time we do a change, um, it's another set of plans. It's another thing that they have to, to endure. Uh, they've been great this entire school year and I wanna thank them. Um, I have heard community members saying, well, our teachers don't want to do this or that. That is not what we're finding. Our, our teachers have been super supportive every step of the way, and uh, they just want the information so we can move forward and so that they can do a great job. And uh, that's our goal, to continue to get the information to them as quickly as possible. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, I see you waiting in the wings. Mr. <laughs> Drayfall, give us your monthly business report. Yeah. <clears throat> Stretch a bit. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, you have in your packet the monthly year-to-date report. Um, we reviewed this and a variety of things at the FAC. Uh, we are in good position as expense versus revenue uh, currently. Uh, a big piece of that we point out is, is the expense on the transportation side being uh, considerably lower than it has been. Uh, in, in the previous years because of, uh, of where we're at right now with our transportation system. Um, obviously next year that will flip around. Uh, we are, I will point out on the revenue side, uh, you have the working cash bonds that are, the bonds are just sold, those are deposited in the working cash in February. Uh, I'll also point that um, March 1st, um, we received a million dollars in federal funds um, that just missed by a day um, this month's year to date. That's the IDEA grant um, that we, you know, if you look at the year to date compared to last year, you can see we're, we're below uh, that helps bring that back up. So cash position and revenue, uh, we're in good position. You know, even considering all of the other issues, uh, we look, look at and note about interest income and how much uh, smaller that is compared to, to last year at this time, uh, which is an unrestricted revenue piece. Uh, overall, um, the last sheet of that, of that report is where we are. We always look at our cash on hand. Um, from one standpoint, we're in a really good position because we're $4.3 million ahead of last year. Obviously, that has a working cash in it. When we take that out, we're about $800,000 to the good. Uh, so we are still uh, ahead of where we were last year at this time. Uh, we know that a big piece of that is the transportation piece. But again, like I said, the, rev the federal revenue piece that does come in March uh, will help uh, boost that as well. Um, one other thing before we get to the uh, some of the action items. Um, oh, on top of the financial plan. You have in there the, I call it the in-progress draft financial plan. Um, when we first talked about a schedule of trying to put a, plan, you know, a draft plan to you in February and a, uh, a final in March, um, I don't know as if we truly grasped some of the pieces that we were putting together and the continual change uh, that we've been working through this year. Um, that was obviously a little bit overly optimistic opinion on my end to think that we could do that. Given the fact that, and, and the goal is always to have to the board uh, a, a picture and an item for them for you to make a decision on uh, so that you can be able to adjust in expense wise um, so that we're in the balanced position and we're meeting those, that structure and those goals. Um, Given that you know, the calendar is extended and we have you have until April to make some of those changes, you know, we we have a little more time with that. We also have that uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Rosentis that we saw this evening that gets rolled into this, which is obviously a huge section, and that had to be in there first. So we will uh, wrap this up, uh, and hopefully we'll also have some uh, better news and more money into that. Um, we understand that there is uh, 
think five billion, rumor was press conference, press release, five billion dollars uh, towards Illinois schools out of the a bill that may be passing Congress today or tomorrow or this week sometime and what that means to us we don't know yet. We may not know that uh, in April yet as well, but that could also have some impact on too, that financial position. So you have that uh, for review. Um, comments are welcome and, and, and always, you know, interested. Uh, and we will make some adjustments and then bring that back to you in April. Uh, one other piece before we get to the action item uh, that are on your agenda. Uh, I had a, I received a call from uh, the county clerk's office uh, this afternoon and uh, actually I think they called this morning I was out and returned uh, their call. Um, in last year's tax levy, uh, and please understand the, the county clerk's office still is working on a system that they're doing a lot of hand entry from one set of books into the, the, the calculation into the computer system. Uh, between the approval sheet and the sign-off that we get uh, in February and March, we just got this year's and sent it back, um, to from that to what was finally extended and put on the tax bills, uh, there was a transposition of a number in the bond and interest levy. Uh, to the, and, and that was about an $80,000 increase in the bond and interest levy last year uh, than what was on the Schedule 4. The county clerk has, under uh, state statute, uh, an ability to go back one year and make a prior year adjustment uh, to correct such errors. So if this had happened two years ago and was just discovered, they literally couldn't do anything. But because it's one year in arrears, um, they can go back and make that adjustment. And so our quick conversation was, well, if that's the case, then go, you know make make that adjustment in the prior year, uh, you know, adjustment and move forward. So um, we're working through that, you know, with them and, and, and so that will be, you know, reflected on this next year's bill. Todd, could you share a little bit about the difference between the bond and interest and the operating okay. funds? So our bond and interest, so operating funds are the education, are, the school district does fund the county. Um, we levy by fund, the board approves that uh, in November of each year. Um, we spend most of our operating by right, education fund, operation and maintenance fund, transportation fund. Uh, we have a fund for, that's the IMRF and Social Security, which is the employer's portions of that. Uh, and the working cash fund, which we have a small levy that is our borrowing bank when we're in a cash position and need to move money um, and we hold on to that. Those are our operating funds. That's what we use to operate each year. Um, it is under the tax cap or PTEL, property tax extension limitation law. Um, that is limited by CPI, new growth, so forth. Um, that's that money. That's what we use to pay salaries, benefits, programs, everything, you know, that along with whatever we get funding from the state and so forth. The bonded interest is those that are, bond, that are under the bonds that are the, the debt those issuance that the board just made um, last month, that is under a different calculation you know, called bond interest. That is limited by the debt service extension base. Um, and for those who have want more interest in this, I would go back to the memo that we have in the tax levy back in November in the board docs because we have a description and, and terminology and then we include to help explain some of this in detail. Um, that is limited to 1.495, 1 1.504, I don't remember right off the top of my head, but somewhere in that range. It goes up uh, next year again 2.3%. It increases by CPI. Um, and that is the, that, that piece that is available for our debt. Um, so when that over, uh, now, we get to the abatements and there's a, com a note in the working cash abatements that you have that the district several years ago had a debt service above its capacity. And so therefore the district was, you know, one of the interest, you know, bond interest fund was negative, is negative right now, because that levy was exceeding what we could, you know, we had to pay more than what we could levy for. Um, and so that is in that piece. 
that's in there. So it doesn't impact operations is what, you know, I think Dr. Bush was getting to is it doesn't impact operations. It impacts the bond interest levy. We will make the adjustment and then move forward. Correct. So this error by the county clerk of $80,000, it's not like we would have to go back into the education fund and short that by $80,000 to make up for that. that. That's a completely separate fund that has nothing to do with this. And I'm sure I gave the longer detail response. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving down to your action items, you have a, a number of, this is a bid season, so you have uh, supply bids for approval. Um, we have fee increases as well. This is that time of year we do that. Uh, and, and those increases are included into the financial plan projection. Um, you also have uh, what the bids that we've been holding on to, we, we have received some time ago that we went through for the mechanical equipment and roof repair. Um, we obviously did not ask for board approval until we had uh, the funds to cover those. And so now that those bonds are in, um, we can ask you for approval on those bids. Uh, you have also two items, the working cash abatements, resolutions. Because those are working cash bonds, they must go into the working cash fund. They then must be, the working cash fund cannot spend money. So to put it into the proper funds, you do a formal working cash abatement that the attorney has prepared. Um, by passing those, you are moving those funds into their proper sources. Uh, there's also the one that goes into the bond of interest, again, talking about that negative balance, uh, that helps take care of some of those issues. And that is all I have, if there are any questions. No. Questions from the board? Thank you. Well, thank you, and the, and the financial uh, five-year plan is looking fantastic. It's gonna be really, really helpful for, for us as we have to, all these little tweaks and things that we're talking about, understanding the impact that it's gonna have a couple years out is gonna be very meaningful and we we totally understand we don't even have our final staffing in here yet so I know in a typical year that would have happened in March but with the extension of the year and all the other stuff going on we the first year always takes a lot of time to set up a template as you as you kind of noticed is how we, we build these things um, on top of that you know everything else the, the fluctuation has not in that process. but it's looking great thank you. so thank you for sharing the, the draft with the board All right, we got some committees that met, but the policy committee did not meet in February, but we did uh, have a legislative committee meeting and a forum. So, Member Doshi. Yeah, happy to give a report. Uh, we held our legislative forum, forum, formerly known as Legislative Breakfast, on February 19th. Uh, and uh, I was just really proud of the team, uh, the administration, the committee, uh, the board are coming together to find a way to make it happen in a pandemic year. Um, we obviously shifted it from a breakfast, which is a live event, to a virtual event. Uh, one of the benefits of making it a virtual event is we ended up having uh, a full slate of our legislators being able to attend. Uh, and uh, having seven legislators attend and provide their perspectives on education, uh, uh, new policy that are coming out of the administration, things to expect from Springfield, really led to a very rich and robust discussion. Um, having the virtual format this year also allowed us to do a uh, new format where uh, we were able to do a whole group space and then also break out in breakout rooms where folks could have kind of like a one-on-nine, one-on-ten -on -nine, one -on conversation with the local legislator. Um, and from all accounts and all the feedback that I've heard, I've, I've, uh, it's gone, it went really well. Uh, and so thanks to the administration, Kevin, your team, particularly Melissa, Megan and Katie uh, for all their hard work in helping make that happen in the legislative committee. Uh, my uh, co-chair, Emily, uh, Member Hannes, uh, to help make this uh, come together. Um, there's a lot of learning that we had. We, just, we had our legislative committee meeting following the forum and there's a few things that we liked about what happened this year that we'd like to be able to bring back for ideally for next year, uh, whether it's a format uh, in a live event or a virtual event. There's also some changes that we think we, we can uh, weigh and make as well, um, but that's uh, for next year's planning efforts. But uh, overall, we were really proud of the event, and uh, thanks everyone for the support. Thank you. Thank you. It was very well done, and uh, in in a year that we have to do a lot of things differently, it was uh, it was it was very welcomed. It was well attended, and I did enjoy the kind of that small group breakout session. It was it was great. So. Any questions, Member Doshin? All right. Uh, the FAC 
committee did, uh, the financial advisory committee did meet as well, though uh, a lot of my thunder was stolen today by <laughs> Dr. Russell and <laughs> by, by Mr. Drayfall. I, they like, they want me to keep me concise, you know. <laughs> so, so that's fine. But just to kind of give you a brief update, what we did was we did review that, that financial plan. Um, normally it would be ready by now, but it's going to be re uh, ready in April. Some uh, obviously the unknowns that we talked about is O'Keep and any additional federal money that may be coming. Even if this passes, we don't know exactly what that looks like and how that could get allocated, stuff along those lines. You heard Dr. Russell talk about the fact that we are forming a small group um, that is going to meet three times prior to the next April meeting. Their main goal is really to do a deep dive look and have a more thorough conversation on Longfellow and all the plans that sort of are coalescing around that, just to make sure we've kind of dotted every I, crossed every T, understand every concern. So they, they've built up a nice group of people um, kind of on, on both sides of the issue and uh, really taking a look, uh, a deep dive look into that. And so I'm really excited to see what's going to come out of that. But the goal is for us to be able to come back to the board in April with some direction on hopefully starting to pursue an opportunity to look for rental spaces. Um, engaging White and Company in a contract to put together a design of what the ASC retrofit could look like and um, taking the first steps at engaging with uh, agents to, to look at offloading that property. So that would, th that would come to a conversation uh, starting next week. We also just did review the bond sale. Um, uh, a lot of credit to, to, to Todd, who really kind of pushed us really, really hard to scramble and add that extra date in there. Well, um, we, it really couldn't have been planned much better. We got a, a rate of under 1%, which under normal times would be unheard of. And those rates are steadily going up right now, so us kind of scrambling to get to that was, a, was um, nice as opposed to waiting until just a regular meeting. But doing that as, as part of a special meeting to make sure we could go in and lock in uh, the rates as they were going up was was well done. So uh, we did have uh, a gentleman. Was he, which organization was he with? That came into the meeting. Right. Oppenheimer. Yeah. Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Yeah. So he came in and, and they went through a, a, a sort of a trend on, on what those those were looking like. Um, we did a, a review of the summer work. That's the stuff that we're bidding on today, and a look at the year to date. And then the last thing I want to tell you about is that one of the things we did have a small discussion about was. Uh, the working cash fund policy. Right now, we never locked in a policy. We were talking about a year ago into putting a working cash fund policy in place that would put us at 35% at of our annual budget in working cash. Um, we felt uncomfortable doing that once the pandemic hit because we obviously went into a deficit spend. We're not sure if we were able to do that, but we're feeling comfortable that we can come forward with a policy. So uh, that could come as early as April. We, we could bring that up for a first read so that the, the board would have an opportunity to, to have that uh, approved so that we could do that. Uh, that concludes my report, unless Steve any, has anything additional to no, add? Nothing to add. Appreciate it. And just to jump in on that uh, policy recommendation, as we reviewed our new board policy manual and aligned with the press uh, manual, one of that, the specific policies around fund balances, the, the policy committee has already um, come to the conclusion or, or shared that that is something that will outsource to the FAC. And so what we had talked about was um, bypassing the policy committee just for this one particular policy because it is more financial and then bringing a draft based on what the FAC had shared it wanted to see at the next April meeting. So I'll work with Melissa and we'll have a uh, draft uh, policy to put on a first reading, obviously not to adopt at the next meeting, but at least to get that out there. Any other questions? Comments? Okay. All right, the district leadership team also met. And uh, for it has been a while since we've had a standard regular update of the district leadership team. Uh, so this is our, has it been, was it, was it the end of last school year that it was more of a, where we kind of did a real, I don't know, I feel like it's been forever. But uh, so we did a, a good recap uh, in all three goals. As you remember, this was formed out of the meet and confer committee once we created the strategic plan to, to keep an eye on all the goals. 
So we reviewed all three individual goals, the first one being on curriculum. And uh, obviously all of our curriculum timelines have, have been impacted by what we're doing, but new math has been implemented and continues to, to be worked through this year uh, with a lot of success. Those social studies has been delayed, though they are piloting in the middle school. Um, we, uh, we've had a lot of additional sort of uh, PD that's taken place that wasn't necessarily planned, that is more around implementation during this time and adapting to the sort of the new norms in, in teaching that we have. Uh, but the re review and revision of curriculum would be due about now. And that's where we, one of the things that we wanted to avoid was sort of long stretches where we weren't actively looking at our curriculums that were in place. That stuff has been put on hold. One of the things with everything else going on we're avoiding completely is pulling teachers out of the classroom to work on additional committee work like that. So that, that in the meantime has been um, put on hold. Uh, we talked about how we define success. Uh, we engaged uh, the, the district that you heard Justin talk about a couple of weeks ago that we're engaging in a similar school study with the NWEA, which is actually a similar district study. Um, so we'll look at districts that have similar demographics um, to ours, so similar sizes, all those kind of things, and we'll compare how they're doing on NWEA map uh, compared to how we're doing. We also are going through a process of reviewing local assessments and report cards and, and just taking a, a look at that again. Um, and, and we want to just figure out how we truly capture um, an understanding on the whole child so that, we're, um, so that we're measuring not just one specific set of test scores. We're not just looking at how we do in grade schools or on the IAR or something like that, but we're really going to. Uh, we are running towards the end of our strategic plan term that we had, had set forward. So they are already beginning to look at what KPIs should look like beyond the term that we put in place. Um, there may have to be a discussion, you know, depending, we're right now in the middle of COVID and, and so many other things, but at some point, do we need to, to just kind of re-up the strategic plan that we're on and, and sort of stay on the trend? Is there something that we need to, is this something that we're gonna have to re-engage in the next couple of years to start building on a new strategic plan? That's something that we'll probably have to start looking at here in the next year or two. Uh, but we also talked about how important it is that the data that we're looking at has some consistency across the board. So one of the things that we talked about in the last meeting, and, and, and Steve, I heard you talk a lot about this, we, we were talking about what we're looking at, how does that get implemented in the classroom? So the conversation that we were talking about is that we as the board tend to want to look at things in aggregate, look at big picture, but we want to know that we're looking at the data on the same spectrum. So the data that they're using in an individual classroom to help students should be looking should be looked at at the the, the school level or, or classroom level by the principal it should be looked at school levels by our central administration and it should be looked at a district level for us with some kind of small breakouts uh, maybe by demographics or by by school but that that they're drilling into that same data so that the data that we're looking at is the same data we're taking action on so that we can see if the improvements that they're they're making by using that data is actually making a difference in the in the schools so we talked about what that could potentially look like and and how we work uh, with that that doesn't mean that some of the data that we've been looking at previously goes away because a lot of that stuff is what gets reported to the state a lot of that is what gets reported on uh, our school report card and stuff like that that all the realtors ask us about so uh, keep on, on the lookout for a lot of those things uh, as well as we continue to, to work on that. So we're going to have a curriculum workshop next or two weeks from now um, where we look at some of this data, but we can start talking about the future of that data as well. We talked a little bit about uh, evaluating uh, SEL. And, and then we talked about the portrait of a graduate, how important that was, but I, I believe it was Tracy that brought up the maybe the need to have a look at lower levels as well. Like, maybe not waiting until eighth grade, but we have some, some other points in the, in the district where we're saying, maybe what does a third grader look like? What does a sixth grader look like as well? So we have an opportunity to catch that uh, before it goes too far. Uh, we had an opportunity to talk about goal two, which is connecting with the community. A district-wide plan was completed back in, in spring of 2020. Um, some goals 
are sort of benefiting from an extended timeline because we've sort of adapted to communicating in, in a new way um, during all the change that we have going right now. But just a, a good note, all of our, our emails and stuff like that have a really good read rate, including our internal staff newsletter, which is, has an 80% open rate. And a lot of that comes from them really cleaning that up, having concise, important information in there. They know that's a, a place that they can go there for, for those key important data points. And it's not flashy, it doesn't have a lot of pictures or whatever, it really just gets nice and concise. Um, we finished a communication survey back in May of 2020, and the DLT was supposed to have reviewed that. That sort of got punted. And so we had a little bit of a discussion, like does it make sense to look at that data now or does it not fit? anymore but we decided that it really did we really do want to take a look at when everyone was focused on our communication before all this stuff happened really where we were how much did you know how much of that were we able to step up and do and really take a deep dive look so the next meeting that the DLT will take a look at that a couple things that we, we're just really proud of is that we partnered with places like the Ed Foundation to do uh, kind of grocery help uh, you know for the community at large and we also did a lot of meal programming for our students in the district that, that, need, that need meals. Uh, we had virtual events with our PTAs. Um, the Superintendent's Community Advisory Council is back up and running. I don't know if you actually had a meeting yet. Mm -hmm. You did, right? Yeah, we have another one March 15th. Perfect. And then, um, and then the policies are in really great shape. So we, we did hear from Jane that but they are way steep in on the administrative regs and, and they're going to keep plowing away at those. The new website is live, and, um, and they've had people looking at that and are, are proud of the consistency that we have between our schools. And then uh, goal three, I'm, I'm just going to sort of punt on because we sort of covered that in the FAC. Goal three was the securing our future. But I did want to mention that um, we do have plans on kickstarting the Citizens Task Force again, and um, we'll be talking about that soon. And, and really kind of see one of the things we were talking about is having that conversation again of, are our priorities in that citizen task force look the same uh, now post COVID? You know, conversations like when we talked about air quality a year ago, that might be perceived very differently today than it was uh, in 2019. All right, that was a lot. So, with that, I'll, any questions? That was a long day anyway, right? We yeah, went right from DLT to a board meeting. Right, that was a long one. Did I, did I miss anything? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on that? Member <laughs> right. Harris, Health and Wellness. Sure. We met on uh, March 4th. Uh, this was our. Um, our February meeting had just been postponed until March, so we were only looking at January numbers because it was too early at that time to have um, anything from February. Uh, the good news, of course, is, is January is looking good so far, but that's not really to be unexpected because in January, it's right after the first year, that's when your deductibles restart, your out-of-pocket costs. So um, we are looking at um, revenue over expenditures by about $150,000, but that we're, not, we're not really looking at a trend yet, but at least it's a good start for the calendar year. Uh, the, the major task of the Health Wellness Committee right now, as I've been talking to the board a lot over the last few months, is well, we're working with CHC to develop a multi-year um, wellness incentive program. The committee has a lot of good questions about the, um, they're being mindful of the structural costs and um, assess assessing how those changes would, would impact, um, you know, our bottom line is, uh, you know, our, our, our um, MRF and also just it would, how it would impact um, what we're currently doing and, and how it would change um, behaviors and how it would change um, participation and so on and so forth. Uh, the next step is to really analyze those costs because it is an investment um, from, from the district. It, 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 the district shoulders some of that cost. The, the members pay into the MRF, so that, that's on them as well. So we really want to make sure that, that it's, it's a good investment. So analyzing that cost, understanding how the, the um, any increases to incentives would impact the efficacy of our wellness program. Short and sweet. Any questions? Appreciate it. Questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Greg. All right, we have no items up for discussion tonight, so that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended for it as a time for the members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. 
The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, I've received uh, one card. Uh, we will ask that you step up to the podium, um, state your name and your attendance area and provide your public comment. I'm looking for Katie Thomas from El Sierra. I want to talk about the return to learn. Welcome back. Hi. Uh, so I'm Katie Thomas. I'm from the El Sierra area. And as I watched the last board meeting, um, during public comment, I was surprised at how many community members said that they were speaking for the entire 58 community. What I heard over and over again was that the community had prioritized additional in-person learning regardless of the cost. As a member of the community, this wasn't my main priority. And the data shared at the last meeting um, showed I wasn't alone with about 49% of our families prioritizing keeping the same teachers and schedule consistency. Um, in my eyes, just the cost of uh, having to rebuild those teacher relationships and the interruptions to schedules and the interruptions to student services and the lack of consistency for our kids and our staff, it just outweighed the potential benefits of more face-to-face in-person learning. I also recognize, though, that a large portion of our community did agree with those public commenters last week and, that the, and with the board's decision to go through with plans for an extended day. What I do hope, though, is that our community can agree that it is going to take a group effort to make this transition successful that we can all provide grace and support to our 58 staff members who are pivoting yet again um, during the school year. And um, perhaps at this point, some of them are even changing subjects, classes. So uh, what can we do to help with this transition? As a board, as district leadership, as community members, what can we do to help them as they tirelessly prepare for yet another big change? Do they need more prep time? Do they need curriculum pacing guides changed a little bit because they're going to have to devote time to relearning those new students that are in their classrooms? Do they need supplies? For some, it'll be like starting a new school year in April. Senior leadership and board, I just truly hope that you are keeping these conversations going with your staff and being flexible with those supports that you can offer them. Families and community members, what are we willing to do to help this transition be a success? Is it helping our students get ready for the transition? Is it setting a positive tone for them if they are one of those one of five kids who is going to have to change teachers? Is it continuing to practice good social distancing, even with spring break vacations, so that we can help mitigate exposure in our schools? Is it simply sending a thank you note to a teacher who you notice is working so hard behind the scenes? I truly believe that we can all play our part in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all we have for cards. Do we have anything uh, for remote? We do not. We do have time, so if there's any additional comments at this time, feel free to come down to the podium. All right, thank you. All right, we'll move on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the January 25th, 2021 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 25th, 2021 special meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the February 8th, 2021 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Who won? Steve. You got to give him one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Melissa, you please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the February 8th, 2021 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the February 16th, 2021 special meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please go roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. 
Member Samanti. Aye. <coughs> Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the February 16, 2021 special meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the February 22nd, 2021 special meeting slash in instructional workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the February 22nd, 2021 special meeting and instructional workshop as presented. On tonight's agenda, we have an, a, a consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? No. If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements, consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. Dr. Russell, uh, we just hired a new principal, so I'll hand it off to you to make an introduction. Yes, I'm very happy to announce that Katie Novosel is officially the new principal of Leicester School starting July 1st, 2021. Whoa. Mrs. Novosel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Novak. <laughs> <laughs> You guys just got a glimpse into our administrative meetings now. <laughs> Mrs. Novosel excelled during a very competitive interview process, which included several rounds of team interviews with staff, parents, and administrators. In addition, Lester parents and staff completed surveys identifying the char characteristics they most desired in their new principal, and I held Lester student focus groups to hear directly from students about what they are seeking in their new principal. All of this feedback helped inform our hiring decision. The interview teams described Mrs. Novosel as child-centered, supportive, energetic, intelligent, caring, and thoughtful. Additionally, as, Lis as Lester's current assistant principal, Mrs. Novosel has cultivated strong relationships with her school community and goes to great lengths to support her students, staff, and families. Kitty has served as Lester's assistant principal since 2016. In this role, she has guided staff through curriculum implementations, created building schedules, facilitated special education and response to intervention meetings, evaluated staff, partnered with the PTA and other community groups, and assisted the principal with the day-to-day -day operations of the school. Prior to District 58, she served several years as a first grade teacher and as a math and reading response to intervention specialist in Riverside and Lyons School Districts. She holds a Master of Arts in Principal Preparation with the Administrative Certification and a Master of Arts in Curriculum Instruction with ESL endorsement, both from Concordia University. She also holds a Bachelor's of Science and Education with Elementary Education Certification from Illinois State University. Mrs. Novosel is already a beloved member of the Lester community, and I have complete confidence that she will serve as an exceptional principal. Katie, on behalf of all of us in District 58, I'd like to welcome your family to the board meeting tonight, and we'd like to once again congratulate you on your well-honored, or well-deserved honor, excuse me. I just want to start by saying thank you so much for this honor. I have been the assistant principal for the last five years at Leicester, and it is an incredible community. I have been blessed to be part of the District 58 family, and I'm so excited to continue to do so in this new role. Um, I, I look forward to starting this next step in my professional career, but more importantly, just beginning this new journey with the Lester staff, parents, and families. And I just am so thankful that you are entrusting me with this responsibility, and I'm very excited and proud to be the next principal of Lester. So thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you to your family for being so patient through all that. Only three hours to go. I think we have some Fairmount Falcons in the crowd, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> recommendation today. The first one is the amended 2020-2021 
school calendar. Is there a motion to approve the amended 2020 through 2021 school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? May I just to, um, because I think we were talking about at the last meeting before this, we were gonna end on a Monday. So we added two days and that is for the- This is for this year's, this is this year's calendar, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, next year's was scheduled for a Monday, but we uh, adjusted oh, that. Oh, okay, okay, I'm confusing too. Okay, so, but it's adding two, two days because of the snow, snow day, day and election day. election day. So Correct. this year was scheduled to end on Tuesday the 8th. We are now going to be ending on Thursday the 10th with tentative promotion dates for our 8th grade on the 9th, which is that Wednesday now. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the amended 2020 through 2021 school year as presented. We also have up for a vote the 2020 through 2022 sc school calendar. Is there a motion to approve the 2021 through 2022 school calendar as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? This one did move from a Monday now to a I'm, Tuesday. I'm, I was combining the two okay yeah. so okay. what we did assuming that we are still going to have to service polling places um jane it's march 15th correct i kept saying st patrick's day but it's march 15th that's that tuesday in march we will take that day as a not an attendance day since we have to serve as a polling place add that day to the end of the year which now will end on a tuesday rather than a monday which was certainly not ideal thank you for flushing that any other questions comments all right melissa please go roll member samanti aye Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the 2020 through 2022 school calendar as presented. Next up is the 2021 through 2022 school fees. Is there a motion to adopt the 2021 through 2022 school fees as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the 2020 through 2021 through 2022 school fees as presented. We have a working cash fund abatement to the capital projects fund. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution abating working cash funds to the capital projects fund? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution abating working cash fund to capital projects fund. Uh, we have a working cash fund abatement to the debt service fund resolution. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution abating working cash funds to the debt service fund? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution abating the working cash funds, uh, abating working cash fund to the debt service fund. Next up, we have a resolution for the honorable dismissal of teachers. Uh, pursuant to section 24-12 of the School Code of Illinois 105 ILCS 5 slash 24-12, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District number 58, DuPage County, Illinois, that the, listed, uh, that the teachers listed in the resolution for the honorable dismissal of teachers found an agenda item um, 14F on tonight's agenda in the board docs that teachers shall be honorably dismissed at the end of the 2020 through 2021 school year because of the decision of the board to decrease the number of teachers employed. At this time, I will entertain a motion to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of teachers. Second. 
All right, any discussion? Yeah, I had, um, when we first got wind of this as a board back in March, I um, was privately stewing about this one. And I had a really good conversation with Jane um, at, the f at, at the end of the last board meeting. And I know that it was um, in the update that the board received over the weekend. But it, if you wouldn't mind just going, this is something that's pretty, and I'll explain my, my reason for bringing this up, but this is something that's pretty important to me. If you wouldn't mind just explaining why we are um, riffing first year teachers as opposed to um, riffing teachers based on, on performance. Do you want Jane or I to? Either. I, I, I told Jane that to, 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 to I, that I would call on her, so if she, maybe she's looking forward to it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure she really is, yes. <laughs> yes, and um, when I spoke to Greg, this year, basically, the reduction in force you would go through the categories. You would look at the evaluation ratings of staff, and then you would reduce by category. Our, for this particular school year, we do have an adjusted evaluation process. In light of the pandemic, a number of the pieces of the rubric that teachers would be evaluated under, we wouldn't be able to observe, or they wouldn't be able to accomplish, such as the um, the collaboration between students and some of that higher level, some of those higher level pieces that really in what our model looks like, they wouldn't be able to attain. So part of what our joint, our para committee is required to do would be to talk about what those adjustments would be. In our joint agreement at the start of the year, we then did come to an agreement that for first year staff, there would be a default rating of proficient. Um, which is not is not typical. It is something that all school districts um, chose to go through. Is this process of discussing what is that pro what is the evaluation process going to look like? In any case, um, as we when we have teachers with the same category, that same rating, you then would riff by seniority. So in effect, we are following those same procedures because by seniority, all our first year people would come first. They would be at that lowest level of seniority. And so, you know, basically what Greg was sharing too is in future years to look, to make sure that we're looking carefully at, we need that RIF deadline to come after we have the evaluations so that there, there may be a scenario where a teacher who has more years experience could fall in a lower category than um, a, a brand new first year teacher. And that's pr it's pretty much what he, and I spoke about it as it's very important to be true to that process. Um, with this year, because of the circumstances with all teachers falling in that same category, it, it does fall in line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, thank you very much. And I, I appreciate just for the benefit of, of the entire board, I appreciate you coming up here and, and uh, taking the time to explain that. Um, I think it was eight to 10 years ago is when Senate Bill 7 passed, and that was when. Um, the, the law in Illinois changed, whereas you could do riffs based on performance instead of just on seniority. So um, before that, it was last and first out. And I was surprised when I came on as a board member and frustrated that I couldn't get the prior superintendent to agree with me that we shouldn't be doing last and first out. That we shouldn't just say, oh, well, if you're the, if you're the youngest person, you're the, you're the first person out the door if we have a riff. So that's when I saw this, I was, I was um, frustrated. But I really appreciate both Dr. Udzentis and Dr. Russell, I appreciate your efforts to, um, to change that paradigm and work and, 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 and understand fully why you made the decisions this year to, um, in light of the COVID crisis, to um, take, a, take a, a, a pause on that. But I'm, I'm excited about moving forward on that. So thank you both very much. And if any other member, this gets complicated really fast with the um, Senate Bill 7 and the, in, in the performance buckets and, and how you go through a rift and where people are certified. Jane and I would be happy to sit down with, with any member and um, give a more thorough review if needed because like I said, this can get pretty complicated pretty fast. But the, the legislation that Greg referenced is something that we all support in this district that everyone has a rigorous evaluation uh, requirement that is fair to all of our staff. Uh, we believe that's very important. And then based on the overall evaluation, you get placed in a bucket. And then if a reduction of force is necessary, you go through the steps that way versus just purely on seniority, which Senate Bill 7 uh, got rid of years ago. Thank you, Greg.
Kevin, any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of teachers. All right, we have a couple bids tonight. The first one is the Pierce Downer roof replacement. Is there a motion to award a base bid, an alternate bid for the roof replacement project at Pierce Downer for a total cost of $1,203,850 to Ellens and Macon Roofing and Sheet Metal Inc.? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the base bid of the and alternate bid for the roof replacement project at Pierce Downer for a total of cost of one million two hundred three thousand eight hundred fifty dollars to Ellens and Macon Roofing and Sheet Metal Inc. We also have a bid for Pierce Downer Mechanicals. Is there a motion to award? The bid for mechanical upgrades at Pierce Downer to C. Esatelli Heating and Piping Contractors, Inc. for a base bid and alternates to 2A, 3, and 4 for a total of $468,800. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for mechanical upgrades at Pierce Downer to C. Esatelli Heating and Pipe Piping Contractors, Inc. for a base bid and alternates to 2A, 3, and 4 for a total of $468,800. We have a bid for 2021 through 2022 general supplies. Is there a motion to award a bid for general supplies to the Warehouse Direct, Inc. for an estimated cost of uh, $21,633.78? Moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for general office supplies to Warehouse Direct Inc. for an estimated cost of $21,633.78. Uh, last bid we have is for 2021 through 2022. Uh, art supplies. Is there a motion to award the bid for art supplies to Runco Office Supply for an estimated cost of eleven thousand two hundred four dollars and twenty five cents? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for art supplies to Runco Office Supply for an estimated cost of eleven thousand two hundred four dollars and twenty five cents. We got some announcements, so please take note of these dates. Uh, Tuesday, March sixteenth at seven a.m. will be the policy committee meeting. It's taking place at the ASC and over Zoom. Monday, March twenty second at six p.m. will be the curriculum workshop that'll take place at O'Neill Middle School. Is All that right. time correct? I just thought I'd verify. Is it at six or is it? That's at what seven? I'm checking right now. Justin, it. We have seven on the other. On the agenda. Okay. Yeah, seven o'clock. All right. Let me correct that. March 22nd at 7 p.m. will be the curriculum workshop at O'Neill Middle School. Right. We're all not all sick. What? Right. We're not all sick from the. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we will now go into closed session. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the employment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? 5 ILCS 122 C1. And for the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of the approval by the body of the minutes or the semi annual review of minutes as mandated by Section 2.06. That's 5 ILCS 122 C21. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session. We'll take a short recess. We'll meet at 9 10 p.m. All right. Brutal. 
board has now returned to open session or returned from closed session uh, at 9:24 p.m. I have one action tonight as a result of closed session. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the February 8th, 2021 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of the contents? So moved. Second. Melissa, we please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 9.25 p.m. Chase, thanks for the cookie. cookie.